Well, as uh, we head into uh, our message for this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Oh, Father, your heart is that the nations would be glad in you. That peoples from all over this globe would be able to sing the praises of Christ the King. And yet, we know that that there are many who have yet to know. And so, Father, we are thankful to be engaged in the task of reaching the nations. I pray as we open your word this morning that you would impress that upon our hearts even more. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the idea of missionaries going around the world, spreading the gospel, is pretty common in church today. And it's, uh, in fact, it'd be odd to go to a church and not hear of them supporting missionaries or sending people out around the world. But this hasn't always been the case. In fact, in the history of the church, there were large periods of time in which missionaries were never sent and concern for those who did not know Christ was virtually non-existent. Now, we know from the New Testament that when the gospel went out into the known world after Christ ascended into heaven, there was great missionary activity. We have the book of Acts to describe that for us, and it describes this amazing reality that as they went out with the gospel, they turned the world upside down with that gospel. But fast forward a few hundred years, and as the church grew and spread and, and grew in, uh, in power, and as then the Roman Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, although it ceased persecution of Christianity, it merged the church and the state together. And because of this, Christianity was then doomed to advance not by words, but by wars, not by preaching alone, but also with swords. The church would enter new lands, not simply with preachers, but also with armies, as it conquered new territory. And while this certainly in God's providence caused Christianity to spread in around the world, It was not the means that God commanded and designed in the Word of God. And so therefore, we have a thousand years of church history virtually where there was little to no true missionary activity. And by true, I mean the declaration of the gospel in and amongst peoples who have the free opportunity to either choose or reject that gospel. Because consider that if there's someone there preaching the gospel to you, but they've also got an army behind them with swords, there's not so much a free opportunity to to choose. Which is why we see when uh, Emperor Constantine made Christianity the the official religion, uh, the membership of the church spiked. Because if you didn't adopt the official religion, there were grave consequences and people were not convictionally uh, attached to the Roman gods, and they said, I'm going to do whatever can preserve my life. And so they chose Christianity for those reasons. Now, the situation began to change. Again, we have about a thousand years in which this is largely the case, but it began to change around the time of the Reformation as the gospel was was being recovered, and particularly with a group known as the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists, uh, they... At the time, I remember that, that baby baptism was the baptism of the day for those thousand years. As everyone was born into the region, they were baptized into the church. Well, the Anabaptist says, uh, no, we believe that only those who confess faith in Christ should be baptized. And so they uh, began teaching this, which was unpopular. But on top of that, they taught that the church should not be wedded with the state. The church was an independent institution established by God. God also established the government, and, and as uh, Pastor R. reminded us, the authorities are, are put in place by God. But these are two separate entities that should not be 
together, and that Christianity should be advanced through preaching alone. And so missionary activity slowly began to appear in certain groups in particular, such as the Moravians and others. But the Western church largely remained unconcerned with the lost people around the world or right around them. Even consider the Great Awakening, a time in this country when preaching and revival began to take place. But that revival was primarily amongst church-going people in the colonies. And there was not much concern for the Native American tribes that were even right around them. Now, there were exceptions to this, primarily David Brainerd, who preached the gospel to the Native Americans before dying of tuberculosis at age 29. His journals were compiled and published by none other than Jonathan Edwards. And it was through those journals that inspired missionaries for generations to come, even to the present day, to give their lives for the cause of Christ. But again, Brainerd was the exception. But we come to the late 1700s, and a young English minister was disturbed by the, this lack of concern for what he called the heathen in the nations around the world. And he tried to address this with a gathering of pastors. He figured, you know what, if we're going to get some action on this, then why don't I address those who are preachers of the gospel to get concern for bringing the gospel around the globe? But before he could finish his address, he was abruptly interrupted by an old minister who said this. He said, young man, sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he'll do it without consulting you or me. Now, this young minister's name was William Carey. And he was used by God to spark what we have called the modern missions movement. He formed a missionary agency in 1792 and took his family to India, giving his life to the cause of Christ in that country. Since then, the evangelical church has seen the need to evangelize the world. And they have devoted many people, many prayers, and many paychecks to see that happen through the generations. And while there is great opposition to the gospel from Satan and those whom he influences, Jesus Christ is building his church around the world and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Today, we're wrapping up our series on the core values of our church. We've called this series Strengthening Our Core, revisiting these core values which were, were drafted by the elders 15 years ago. These values are central to who we are as a people. They're convictions that drive us, that motivate us. So far, we've studied the following. We've looked at how we are devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen how we are determined to obey the Bible. How we are dedicated to prayer. And how we are daring to minister by faith. I encourage you that if you have not been here for those previous messages to go on our website and listen to those to catch yourself up. But today we are examining our fifth and final core value, which is that we are developing disciples to reach the nations. Developing disciples to reach the nations. And we will examine this core value by asking two simple questions. Two simple questions. First, why do we endeavor to reach the nations? And secondly, how do we endeavor to reach the nations? Why and how? Let's first look at the why. Why do we endeavor to reach the nations? Why does the Christian church seek to evangelize the world? Now, in one sense, there are many, many reasons that we could pull from Scripture. And I believe that there are definitely some initial reasons for why we do this, but there is an ultimate reason. All of these reasons are valid. None of them can be left out. The Scripture gives us all of them, but I believe there's one that drives all of them. So first, we'll look at two kind of initial reasons, and we'll then thirdly look at that final ultimate reason. The first initial reason is the command of Christ. Why do we go to the nations? Christ. 
Because Jesus told us to. It's, it's as simple as that. His command to the church was to take the gospel message to the nations. And we've seen this even throughout this series through what is known as the Great Commission. The Great Commission, it's great because it's given by the greatest one, Jesus, uh, to his church, and it's our commission, our, our orders to go. Now, this Great Commission is not just given in one place, but it's given in multiple places throughout the Bible, one in each of the four Gospels, and also once in the book of Acts. So let's just review those this morning. The first is found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." Or take the book of Mark, Mark 16, verses 15 through 16. It says, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Or the book of Luke. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. John, Jesus said to his disciples, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And finally, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a verse we looked at last week, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now I want you to notice several features of these passages collectively pulled together. The first is that they are spoken by none other than the risen Christ. Jesus, who died upon the cross, was buried in the ground for three days, and rose again. He then speaks with all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew records. And so the risen Christ, the Lord over all, is the one who is giving this instruction. Notice also that this mission that Jesus sends his disciples on is a speaking mission. It's a preaching mission. There's a message to be proclaimed, a gospel that must go out and be shared. They must be witnesses, which means their mouths must open and declare what this truth is. In the, in the Luke passage, we saw that it's repentance of sin and forgiveness is found in Jesus. That's the message the world needs to hear. And we as his followers must proclaim. Notice also that the goal is not just to make converts, but to make disciples. It's not just to see people flip their allegiance from something else to God and then to go on their way to the next person. But he says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Discipler, disciple simply means a learner. Someone who comes on, we use the word follower, someone who comes and follows behind Jesus, seeks to learn from him, to learn his ways, and to obey him in everything. Notice also that the scope of this ministry given to the disciples and to the church is far and wide. This is not a, a, a narrow, focused mission. He didn't just say, go to your friends and neighbors. He didn't just say, go to the house of Israel as he had told his apostles earlier in the ministry before the cross. But here, after his resurrection, he says, go to the nations. Go to the nations. And that's repeated throughout these, gospel, these great commission passages. Remember in Acts, he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, the Titus circle. Then it's going to expand to Judea and Samaria. And then it, the gates open wide to the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts records that. In fact, that's really an outline of the book of Acts. It starts with Jerusalem, 
then it goes to Judea and Samaria, and then we see it going to the ends of the earth. And finally, we can see from these passages that the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, equips His disciples to accomplish this task. Jesus sends us but goes with us. He says, behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That means, friends, that He's with us as we do this very same task. Jesus envisioned that this was not just for those disciples of that first century, but this was for all of Jesus' followers until he comes again. Jesus says that the Father is the one who sent Jesus, and Jesus is then sending his disciples. And he promises that the promise of the Father, the Spirit, would come upon his people and would equip them to go. So we do not, God does not say, kick us out the door, call us to go, and, and say, good luck. No, the triune God is intimately involved in seeing his gospel spread throughout the, the world. And so as I've said, this mission remains with us today. Our Lord commands us to go. So why do we go to the nations? We go because Jesus commands us to go. We want to obey our Lord. But our obedience to the command is not the only reason why we reach the nations. It's not like we simply say, well, if you say so, God, I guess we'll go. You told us it's a command. We'll obey. And some sort of reluctant obedience. We need to pull in other realities. So we go because of the command of Christ. But we secondly, we go because of the lostness of the world. We go because of the lostness of the world. And these are all tied together. Right? The reason Jesus sends out his people is because the world has a great need. This world is filled with an estimated 7.7 billion people. And 2.3 billion of those claim to be Christians. It's still the largest religion on the planet. But... That leaves 5.4 billion people who are without Christ. And those numbers are assuming that all those who claim to be Christians are truly Christians and truly have faith in Christ, which we know isn't the case. The, the Word of God tells us that's not the case. And so these numbers of 5.4 billion at least who don't claim the name of Jesus is staggering. It's hard to wrap our minds around numbers so great. But even within this 5.4 billion is an even more desperate group because, and this is what missiologists call unreached people groups. These are, are, are people who live in a culture and society in which not only do they not know Christ, but even if they went looking around to, to talk to someone about Jesus, If they wanted to, there would be no one within their immediate circle who would know Jesus at all. The rate, the percentage of Christians within their their culture is so low that the odds of them talking to another Christian at any point in their entire life is next to nothing. There are over 7,000 unreached people groups which is about 46% of all the people groups in the world and comprises about 3 billion people. 3 billion people that even if they woke up one day and said, I need to talk to someone about Jesus, there would be no one that they would know to talk to. And we look at these numbers and our hearts rightly break for those who are lost. Folks, every day, over 150,000 people pass from this life into the next. It was sobering. I, you kind of Google estimated how many people die every day, and there's a counter for number of births, number of deaths, and to see it click 1.8 deaths every second. People passing out of this life, out of this life, into eternity, into eternity, into eternity, into eternity. And many of them pass into eternity with no knowledge that there is the wrath of God, the throne of God, 
and that there is salvation found in Christ. And so this, these needs of the world around us compel us to go, compel us to go with the gospel. But we cannot depend on simply love for our fellow men to fuel missions. It cannot be simply the ultimate reason. For we know that love for our fellow man uh, wanes and is not sustained often over long periods of time. What happens when this compassion wanes? Do we stop spreading the gospel? Where do we find the motivation to even love them, these people that may be so different from us? And why is it loving to share Christ with the world? Well, this brings us to the ultimate reason we endeavor to reach the nations, and that is the glory of God. The glory of God. The glory of God is the ultimate cause and goal of missions. We want to see God treasured and delighted in and worshipped by all the peoples on this planet. We want His name to be hallowed and revered. We want Him to be magnified as the only great and glorious one. There's none that compare to Him. And it's because this isn't the case, friends, that we go into all the world. Many of you know John, Pastor John Piper's words that he begins his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, a book on missions, but some words that he starts that book out have been repeated often, and rightly so, and I repeat them for you this morning. He writes, Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exists because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions. Because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over, and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Worship, therefore, he says, is the fuel and the goal of missions. It's the goal of missions because in missions, we simply aim to bring the nations into the white-hot enjoyment of God's glory. The goal of missions is the gladness of the peoples and the greatness of God. That's clarifying, isn't it? The missions is not ultimate. It's not the ultimate goal, but worship of the great and awesome God is the ultimate driver of the church. It's the fuel and the goal. Because you see, God is the greatest being. He deserves to be worshipped by all peoples, but He's not, and so we engage in missions. And this all begins with the fact that God is passionate for His own glory. God cares about His name, and that His name is treasured and honored and revered. And He does all that He does so that His name is glorified. Everything He does is for this purpose. We see this clearly in Isaiah chapter 48, verses 9 through 11, where he, the Lord says, For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you that, you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. See, if we're going to see the glory of God as the fuel and the impetus for our own mission activity, we've first got to see that it's the glory of God that fuels God in all that He does. He's the most passionate about His own glory. And he wants his people to see that glory and to savor it and to enjoy it. Because that's the most loving thing for you to do. 
There's nothing better on this planet for you to do than to enjoy God and his greatness and in his glory. That's why he gives himself to us in the gospel. And that's why we want others to know the gospel, that they might know and enjoy and savor the glory of God. Because this world is filled with people enjoying so many lesser things, trying to seek satisfaction from that which does not satisfy. And yet we were created to find our satisfaction in God alone. That's what we were created for. God does not act so that man's name would be exalted. He does not act, he does not save so that that man would know how great they are. God could never act that way because that would be a lie. God acts in such a way so that he would be seen for how great he is. So that his name would be exalted. But see, we are created to live for the glory of God, but as Romans 3.23 says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We don't treasure God's glory. We, we look or we read or hear about God being great or God being glorious, and we yawn and we move on with our day because our hearts are, are so wicked and sinful that we would rather delight in these, these ridiculous substitutes rather than delight in God. And because we've rejected the glory of God, because we delight in our own glory, mankind is damned to everlasting torment for their wicked rebellion against their Creator. That is the truth that this world does not want to come to grips with. But for all those souls that pass into eternity, that is is the truth. And how are we saved from that torment? How are we saved? The only salvation is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it's as God shines into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As we see the glory of God through Jesus, then We fall on our knees in repentance and faith, clinging to Jesus as the only name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. We must have our eyes opened to see Jesus as the only sacrifice for our sins. We must see him as our only access to God. We must see Jesus as the only one who can reconcile us with God. Only through him can we be forgiven of our disdain and our trampling upon the glory of God. And so, we take the message of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to all the nations. That they might see Jesus and be saved. Promise is translating the Bible so that they might see Jesus and have that message proclaimed to them and find salvation. But it's not only our message to the world, but that it's not only our message to the world that's a declaration of the glory of God, but it's also the why we engage in missions is for the glory of God. As we're talking about, why do we seek, why do we seek to reach the nations? It's because we want to see God glorified. And for this, I I want you to see that this was the motivation of Paul's ministry, the ultimate goal of Paul's ministry. And for that, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can find it on a pew Bible on page 1147. Page 1147. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. Paul, talking about his ministry to the Corinthians, says this, For it is all for your sake, 
so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Now, if we didn't have that final phrase, you would think that this verse would indicate that the goal or reason for missions is is for the sake of the people. Because he begins by saying, it is all for your sake. And so there's a sense in which Paul is ministering for the sake of the Corinthians. He loves them, he cares for them, he's doing this for them. That's an initial, immediate reason, but it's not the ultimate reason. The ultimate reason he gives us at the very end of the verse, that as this grace of God spreads to more people, and more people have their eyes open to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that they will result with hearts and gratitude and thanksgiving to God, and in that then God is glorified. Paul wants to see grace extend. He does all of this ministry so that God would be glorified. And this is the ultimate motivation for all ministry and all missions. We minister, we declare the gospel because we want to see God glorified. So why do we endeavor and seek to reach the nations? Because God is glorious and there is none like him. Because God is great. And because the greatest thing we can do for someone is to preach the gospel to them that they may see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, salvation is not just a get-out-of-jail-free card that helps them to simply deal with their eternal destiny. They stick it in their pocket and go, great, thanks. Now I'll pull that out whenever I need it. No, it's a, it's a radical reorienting of the affections of the heart so that s- someone who once loved their sin and loved themselves and, and did everything for themselves now turns outward and, and delights in God and loves Him and wants to see His glory manifested and His glory delighted in. It's a changing of what we love. Salvation brings us to see the greatness of God for all of eternity. And in this, the Bible promises there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. The aching of the human heart for joy and satisfaction can be found nowhere else but in the triune God of the Bible. He has made us to enjoy Him. And if you're here this morning and you are listening to my voice, I tell you that the best news that you can hear is that God has sent His Son to save you from yourself. To turn you away from sin and selfishness. And to give you life in the name of Jesus. That you might have pleasures forevermore. And fullness of joy. in knowing Him. He calls you to repent of your sin. To turn to Him in faith. And to find the salvation of For your soul. It's only because of the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross that you can have hope for the next life. The only hope for eternity, the only path to true everlasting joy is by trusting in Jesus alone. I exhort you, don't leave today without knowing for sure that you know Jesus for your eternal hope. So we've answered here the first question. Why do we endeavor to reach the nations? simply because he's worthy, and so we must go. But the second major question I want us to ask and answer this morning is, how do we reach the nations? How? In other words, how do we here at Foothill go about accomplishing this goal? Well, in reaching this goal, we begin in our Jerusalem. Again, we, we remember the words of Jesus that start the gospel starts in Jerusalem, goes to Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. If we think of that even in our own circles, we, we look to spread the gospel to all those around us. We begin in our, in our own backyard, as it were, within our own sphere of influence. We talked about this last week, about daring to minister by faith, that you and I are called to make disciples in the spheres of influence that God has placed us, speaking the gospel and seeking to move people to greater relationship with Jesus. We desire to see God glorified and God treasured among our neighbors, our co-workers, our family, our friends. And because he's not delighted in by those around us, we 
must speak of Christ so that they might be saved. Also, within our realm of ministry here around us, we support two couples who are endeavoring to make disciples in our surrounding communities, extending our disciple-making influence even beyond our known neighborhoods. Jim and Christy Kirchival are working with crew to reach college students. And Steve and Karen Hydanis are working with the Iwana ministry to reach thousands of children in the L.A. area. And so we're working here amongst us and, and even beyond our own communities here in the L.A. area. But we want to reach a harvest far beyond, far beyond our communities here. And so we send men and women to the nations. And it's this sending of international missionaries that has defined FBC since it began 27 years ago. We go through a list of, of half a dozen or more people that we have sent out from this body to go. We heard of promise just this morning. We're going to hear from her next week. Most recently, we, many of you were here, we sent out Leif and Kathy Jensen to French-speaking Canada. And for our church size, friends, this is a remarkable track record. And to God be the praise. To God be glorified for those who he's placed the burden in hearts and he's equipped them to be able to go and for them to go and for us to be able to support them and sustain them. And so this is all to the praise of the glory of God. And so as we send missionaries to the nations, I want us to look, how, answering this question, how do we reach the nations I'm going to answer that by asking two more questions. Number one, what do our missionaries do to reach the nations? And what do we do to reach the nations? In other words, those who are already out there sent, what, do they, what are they about? And how are they seeking to reach the nations? And then us here who are senders, who are, who are called to stay, what do we do to be about this work of reaching the nations? First, what do our missionaries do to reach the nations? And this comes in... Two simple activities summarizing all that they do is number one, gospel proclamation, and number two is church planting. Gospel proclamation, and two is church planting. We believe that the Bible is our model for how we are to be about ministry, and particularly how we are to be about missions in reaching the world. And what we see in the book of Acts is that the apostles went out with a message, the gospel, and they proclaimed that. And this declaration of the gospel is what brought about repentance and faith. Let's turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and just see this in a few places. Acts chapter 2. Here the Holy Spirit has come, equipped the apostles. Peter preaches. And we see at the conclusion of his words in verse 38. They ask in 37, brothers, what shall we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What do we see as a response to this? Verse 41. And so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. We see declaration of the gospel. We see a response to that in reception and faith. Next chapter, Acts chapter 3. Declaration of the gospel in verse 26. God, having raised in the conclusion of uh, Peter's sermon, saying, God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And we see a response in chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Again, declaration of the truth of Jesus, 
And there's a response of repentance and faith. And this goes on throughout the book of Acts. This is the, the model, is that they proclaimed the gospel, and then there was a response of repentance and faith. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone responded in faith. There were many that opposed the gospel, and which is why there was great persecution to the apostles as well. But in terms of seeking to go out for Christ, they proclaimed the gospel. And so when we send folks out to reach the nations, they go out proclaiming the gospel message. In dependence upon the Spirit, praying that God would grant faith and repentance. And as we said earlier, they don't go out to simply produce converts, but to produce disciples, those who are seeking to grow and understanding all that God has written to them in the Word of God so that they might be faithful disciples following the Lord. But on top of this, our missionaries are not simply looking to produce independent Christians, a bunch of isolated Lone Ranger Christians who simply <clears throat> have had their allegiance changed. They are, we believe that Christians are to congregate into churches. The task is not complete until we see churches planted. That brings us to the second thing that our missionaries are doing, and that is church planting. The example in Acts is that people were converted to Jesus, and then churches were formed. Churches were formed. I want you to see this particularly in Acts chapter 14. So turn a couple chapters to the right to Acts 14. This is near the tail end of Paul's first missionary journey. And it's an ex example that we see of Paul's missionary journeys. He's gone through several cities preaching the gospel. He's been stoned. He's been kicked out. He's been left for dead. But he's preached the gospel, and there's those that have responded. And so... It says in Acts 14, verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So notice what we see here. All that we see in, the, in, the, in the, the narrative before this is that Paul is going through these cities preaching, some receiving, some kicking them out, all the rest. Well, here he goes back through those same cities. And we see that disciples were made, that there were those who believed. We see Paul strengthening and encouraging these disciples which I think we get from this, is that, the, again, these disciples are not made to be independent units. They need, we need, but as believers, we need one another. God did not intend us for us to be individual, isolated Christians out in the world, but for us to be encouraged and strengthened. In fact, part of your perseverance is dependent upon being a part of a local church where you can be encouraged and strengthened. We weren't made to persevere apart from the church. But not only were believers and disciples encouraged and strengthened, but they were warned of suffering as well. In other words, listen, you're following Jesus, but have you counted the cost? There's great tribulation coming. Paul was bore the battle scars to remind them of the truth of that statement. But finally, we see that churches are established. He didn't just gather believers together, have a little pet talk, and send them on their way. He set up an institution in that, those cities, namely a church. We see that, that in verse 23, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church, he's already setting up leadership. Elders, plurality of elders, not one elder per church, but a plurality of elders. That's why we believe, as the biblical model, that God designs for there to be a group of qualified men in each church to help lead and shepherd and guide that church. And so here you have a church, a group of believers who gather together and are led and shepherded by a group of elders. And so, this is what we endeavor to see happen through our mission's efforts, is that churches be planted Churches be strengthened. Churches be set up in a biblical model. Now, 
Different missionaries can be involved in different activities that might support this overall goal of church planting. There's those that could be on the front lines of evangelism or as promises with Bible translation. Or it could be in training local pastors and leaders to fill indigenous churches. Or it could be even supporting uh, church planting efforts through medical work or relief work or teaching missionary children. But all of these efforts that we are looking to support missionaries in have the greater goal of being involved in church planting because we believe this is the model given for us in the New Testament. We believe that these churches should be self-sustaining, that they're able to exist on their own, that they're self-governing, that they have their own leadership, and that they're self-propagating that they're able to feed them itself, they have teachers able to, to feed itself and able to then make disciples who then make disciples. This, we believe, is the biblical model. And this is what our missionaries are doing. How are they reaching the nations? They're involved in gospel proclamation and church planting. But secondly, how do we reach the nations? And this is where it brings it home for us here this morning. How do you and I be involved in developing disciples to reach the nations? How does this core value get baked into our souls, and how does it look in our daily life? And there are four main things that I believe we as a church body can be doing to reach the nations. The first is supplication. The first is supplication, simply meaning prayer. It's been said that the church advances on its knees. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is a spiritual battle. And we looked a few weeks ago at the fact that, that we are dedicated to prayer. And this is one of those reasons is because we want to see God's glory go forward, but we know that, that the opposition is spiritual. And so we must get on our knees and pray that God would advance his gospel through his power. If developing disciples to reach the nations is core to us as a church, then we will be a praying church. What do we pray for? We pray for the supply of missionaries, for one. We pray that God would send. Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38 says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We need to pray that God would raise up even more from among us to go into all the world. May God raise up laborers for his harvest. We pray also for the success of the missionary message. We want the word of God to go forward. 2 Thessalonians 3.1, Paul says this, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of God may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. It says, pray that the word of God may not have any barriers and may continue to go forward and may continue to spread. Friends, that, we must be praying for that. Amongst the nations where our missionaries are scattered, the word of God will be able to go forward. We want the word of God to pierce hearts. We want to see people brought to faith. We want the, the nations to be glad. We want the peoples to praise the Lord. And so we must support the work of our missionaries through praying that the word of God would go forward. We pray also for the safety of our missionaries. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 2. We just looked at verse 1. Verse 2 says, And pray for us that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. It's right to pray for the safety of our missionaries. Now, God is sovereign over their safety, but we pray and ask that they would be safe and protected for the cause of Christ, that they would continue to be fruitful. And so as we look at this first point, how do we get involved in reaching the nations? We pray. So I ask you, how are your prayers for the nations? How is your heart burdened for the cause of Christ around the globe? Do you feel deep down in your bones that we need to battle with our missionaries? That they are depending upon us to pray on their behalf, that they might be sustained, and that their, their gospel might be met with fruit? Friends, we need to battle on our knees for the cause of Christ. Second, we not only supplication, but sending. 
we send. Now, we don't have time to look at it this morning, but Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, describe how the early church, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, set apart, set apart Paul and Barnabas to be sent out and to begin that first missionary journey. And what we see there is that churches send missionaries. Missionaries don't just decide to up and go. They are set apart and prayed upon by the church, and they are sent out by churches. Churches plant churches. Churches send missionaries. We must be involved in sending, must be involved in raising up and sending out. Friends, I pray that Foothill Bible Church continues to be an engine of sending out people for the cause of Christ around this globe. There may be some even here this morning that God may be prompting to go overseas with the gospel. Parents, the Lord may call our children to go. Children, teenagers, God may be calling you to go to those who have not heard. Friends, He is worthy. We must be ready to go and ready to send. All for His glory. The third way we engage in reaching the nations is supervision, which is, I think, an often overlooked point of the way the local church is involved in missions today. Supervision. What do we see happen after Paul and Barnabas go on their missionary journeys? Do they just go home to rest? No, they, they go back to the sending church. The church that sent them out, they go back and they give a report because they believe there's an accountability to that sending church that they went out and accomplished all that they were called to do. And so, in the same way, we believe that we need to have a, a certain role over our missionaries to, to hold accountable and to see that, that they're doing all that God has called them to do and that we might be able to help them in, in what they're doing. And by God's grace, FBC has done this, done this very well. The Lord has used Pastor Art and his wife Kim to provide great amounts of check-in and support to our missionaries, and uh, for that we are, we are very grateful. But the fourth and final way that we can be involved in this reaching the nations is by support. And in one sense, we've already been saying that, right? But we support with our money, and we support with our prayers. We do it in a manner worthy of God. We do it to, to see that they are provided for in all the ways possible so that they might go out and do their work. And we support them. Again, as I mentioned, Pastor Art and Kim uh, spend countless hours that you never know about through modern communication of Skype and phone calls helping to, to support our missionaries through spiritual counsel and through praying with them. God is enables us to be able to support them even while they're out on the field. And I know your letters and your prayers and your emails are a part of that support as well. Friends, we continue to support them even while we are here and they are there. Well, William Carey, that father of modern missions that we talked about earlier, he famously said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. God is sovereign over our efforts to reach the, reach the nations, but we must endeavor to do all that we can, attempt all that we can. And I pray that by God's grace, Foothill would continue to reach the nations with earnestness. And that in the days ahead, we may pray more, we may send more, we may preach more, and by the grace of God, see more come to know the glory of the living God. Wouldn't that be marvelous? all to the praise of his name. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our Father, we praise you because you indeed are the most glorious. You are the perfect one, the holy one. And Father, there are billions around the world that do not know that. And we want to be involved in getting that gospel to the lost. I pray, Father, for us as we leave here this morning that you would help us to be more captivated with your glory to see it as weighty and significant as you do and that it might propel us to be about the gospel 
in our very lives, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, and that we'd be about the gospel around the globe. All for your name's sake. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.